Welcome to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Good afternoon, I'm Larry Jacobs. I am a faculty member here at the University of Minnesota, and it's a pleasure to welcome you. I wanna first give you a heads up. We've got an audience here in person. Uh, and those of you who are following online, we want you to participate. You'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a button, Q&A. That's your opportunity to participate. Send us your questions. We're gonna get them uh, involved in what we're talking about here. Also, you'll see there's a transcript button. And if you'd like to use a transcript, that's also available. Welcome to our program this afternoon, Pushing Against Jim Crow, The Amazing Worlds of African-American Fraternal Orders. Uh, just delighted uh, to have this program. Also want to let you know about our upcoming programs here at the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance, the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. May 4th, which is next week, at 5 p.m., we're going to have an online conversation with New York Times columnist Tom Friedman, and information is available on our website for that. May 10th, we are going to be hosting a conference um, based on our pathbreaking um, program in election administration. We are really one of the very few programs in the country who are providing professional training for uh, folks who are currently in election administration, those who wanna get involved, that'll be 10 to three, and it's got an all-star cast of folks looking at the issue about the, the, uh, the, the departure of about a quarter of all election officials. Um, and how do we get people back into the profession? Uh, lots of really interesting um, uh, presentations. Um, that's May 10th, 10 to two. Um, June 14th, we're gonna be uh, starting um, our series, Conservative Voices from the Humphrey School, and we'll be starting with the National Review's uh, Ramesh Ponaru. That's uh, June 14th. That'll be at noon. More information about that. Um, today's program, which we are very excited about, Pushing Against Jim Crow, um, we're delighted uh, to have with us uh, Enid Logan, um, who will be our moderator and leading the discussion. Um, Professor Logan is in the sociology department here at the University of Minnesota, has done quite a bit of research and most recently has been studying um, white conservative and white liberal discourses around race. Um, and by the way, her own personal story connects with today's topic. Um, Professor Logan and many members of her family have belonged to a parallel type of organization that we're going to be talking about today, namely college based black fraternities and sororities, so that's gonna be fun. Um, our star presenter is Professor Theda Scotchpole, who is at Harvard. Uh, Professor Scotchpole is a, a seminal figure in political science, sociology, and history. Um, she is credited with uh, pioneering historical institutional research. Um, she has written extensively for academic audiences, but also for popular audiences. Uh, she's president of the American Political Science Association, as well as the Social Science Historical Association. Um, she began her career with a landmark book, States and Social Revolutions, followed it up with other landmark books, including Protecting Soldiers and Mothers, which really helped to ignite um, the study of history and American political development. Um, one of the things that's quite extraordinary about Theta Scotchpole is she is a scholar. She's also a doer. And a lot of her work has been about engaging people out in the real world, talking to them in diners or wherever they are, but also organizing scholars to become more engaged in the worlds around them. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Theta Scotchpole. Well, thank you, Larry. And, you know, I'm always delighted to be invited to Minnesota. And as I told my husband on the phone this morning, uh, when I take a plane to the Twin Cities, people are so polite. And it's such a different experience than flying to New York. Uh, so uh, I'm a Midwesterner by origin. I grew up in Michigan, and I always feel 
uh, delighted and at home when I come here. And of course, there's such a vibrant community of engaged citizens and scholars from different fields. So what I'm going to talk about today is a topic that grew out of work I did some years ago to try to understand all the voluntary associations that recruited a lot of dues-paying members between the 19th century and uh, very recently. Uh, and uh, during that work, I became interested in collecting any old documents or old badges that I could find. People used to wear badges that you're going to see in this presentation. Now that I'm getting toward the end of my career, I've decided to do a write-up of what the groups were that people were members of. And I'm starting with 80 African-American groups that I have 300 badges for, but I'm going to get on to the Scandinavians that are also thick on the ground here in, uh, in, the, in the Twin Cities, so I hope I get a chance to come back later. But in any event, let me uh, move quickly through what I have today because I have quite a bit. Um, okay, got to get this to move. It's not moving. That's bad. <laughs> Am I missing something? Okay, all right. All right, so let me just start with a, a kind of brief introduction to why this topic matters, even if you haven't heard of a lot of the groups that I'm going to be talking about. Um, back in the late 19th century in Mississippi, after the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction, during a period where uh, voting rights for blacks were being destroyed, uh, rolled back, uh, a group was founded in Mississippi called the Universal Brotherhood. You can see the beautiful badge there of the man and woman. It, it admitted men and women alike shaking hands in Natchez, Mississippi. And the founder of it was uh, George Bowles, who was elected three times to the Mississippi State Legislature, even after the rollback of black voting rights started, which means he got a lot of white votes as well as black votes in his district. Um, just five years after George Bowles died in 1899, the violent white supremacist governor of Mississippi, James Vardaman, who said that he would lynch every African American in the state if he had to do so in order to restore white supremacy, became governor. And one of the things he did was to refuse to approve charters for Negro lodges, as he called them, and everybody did then benevolent institutions because he said he did not believe it was good for the country for the Negroes to have such institutions. Well, just as Governor Vardaman feared, organization matters for people who are marginalized and facing oppressive circumstances. Black fraternal orders of the kind he refused to charter but which already existed and existed after him, countered racial oppression by fostering mutual aid among people, opening opportunities, much more than white groups did, for female as well as male leadership and pushing back against segregation and disenfranchisement. So that's my theme for today. Now, let me just be clear what I'm talking about when I talk about fraternal orders. I'm not actually talking about college-based sororities and fraternities, although those are cousins of what I'm talking about. I'm talking about much larger associations built from the 1800s on by Americans of all classes and ethnic backgrounds with dues-paying members who meet regularly in local chapters called lodges or other things linked to state and national centers. And most of them, at one time or another, provided sickness and death benefits, although not all. And all of them were involved in serving their surrounding communities. So that's the kind of organizational animal that I'm talking about. It has local units, state or, or regional units, and national uh, centers. And when my colleagues and I wrote our book uh, 20 years ago, almost, What a Mighty Power We Can Be, about African-American fraternal associations, we wondered whether segregation and oppression and poverty would prevent African Americans from organizing as much as white counterparts did in the 19th and 20th century. But what we found is the opposite. 
we found that Blacks were super organizers and super joiners, that they created more groups and had more uh, uh, lodges and chapters on the ground than their white counterparts, if you consider their share of the population. I've returned to this topic now for the reasons that I've told you in order to document my collection. And I find now that there's a lot more information that I can share beyond what went into the book. I think you all have a handout and I just wanna orient us to the big picture. Um, there are hundreds of these orders and I'm, you'll be relieved to hear, I'm not gonna talk about hundreds today, um, but they fall into two major types. There are orders distinctive to African-Americans often with biblical names, that is, they don't have any white parallel. And those, most in most cases, admit men and women together, sometimes to meet in the same units, sometimes to share governance of the order. Uh, and then there are orders that are parallel to major white orders, um, white fraternal groups that grew up and excluded Blacks, and then the Blacks created their own alternative, often with a bolder name. So uh, some of those are on the list. Now, I just wanna stress from the start that the word fraternal means brotherhood, and I'm going to use it because that's the phrase that's used. But um, very early in this research, I discovered that a hypothesis that I had going in, which is that African-American women would be organized in churches and African-American men would favor fraternal orders was dead wrong. African-American women are actually, uh, in relation to their population, more involved in the fraternal orders than the men. And uh, that's true because most orders either have parallel partner sides to them, uh, but we also looked in city directories around 1900 and we found black female lodges were more numerous than, than white female lodges and that black, than black male lodges. So this is a, a sphere where women's leadership and organizational capacities has been strong from the very beginning. And that's gonna be a theme. There are some black orders that had female heads and founders. And there is one that I'm gonna talk about today, the United Order of Tents, that's all female. So I'm gonna start quickly with some very brief introductions to the major parallel orders. The best known, and a lot of you may have heard of it, is the Prince Hall Masons. In my city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, in 1775, Prince Hall and 14 other free black men tried to join uh, a Boston Masonic Lodge. They were refused by the Americans, or the Colonials, as they would have been called then, and they turned instead to the British Masons, who admitted them and founded the Prince Hall, the first lodge of the Prince Hall Masons, which you can still see. And by uh, later in American nationhood, Prince Halls spread all over the country and in some ways are the oldest and most prestigious uh, black order. People like Thurgood Marshall, for example, uh, was a proud member and they still exist. What grew to be the largest African-American fraternal order was founded in 1842 when African Americans tried to join the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Some of you, if you go to cemeteries, you'll see the IOOF on gravestones. They were refused, once again, by the white Americans, but um, a man who was sailing back and forth on a ship to Liverpool in England said, well, you're gonna refuse us, we'll just go to an older British order. Uh, and so he got a charter from the Grand United Order of Odd Fellows and formed what uh, eventually became the largest order. It had 1,000 lodges across the United States and into the Caribbean, Liberia, and Latin America by 1886, and 4,800 lodges by 1915. So this is a massive, more than one in 10 black men belonged to this order. So, um, much did this order cherish its origins uh, in, as, as chartered from Britain, that some of the badges people wore, like this purple one from one of the oldest lodges in Philadelphia, and that really elaborate one from a town near me, Malden, Massachusetts, kept the British flag along with the American flag to symbolize the continuing tie. 
This order linked together these magnificent headquarters buildings in Philadelphia and Atlanta to tiny little lodges in places like Southern West Virginia. There was a women's partner order founded called the Household of Ruth, built around the biblical story of Naomi and Ruth in the Bible, whither thou goest, I will go, thy people shall be my people. And by the early 1900s, there were more Ruth lodges than there were Black Eyed Fellows lodges in many places. Another parallel order was the Knights of Pythias of North America, South America, Europe, Asia, Africa, and Australia. And it was founded when um, Black men who, who were members of a mixed uh, uh, integrated lodge during Reconstruction uh, had to respond when whites went for white supremacy and exclusion. And so they said, okay, we'll found our own Knights of Pythias order. And uh, this order is especially important for being very large, but also for defending its name against lawsuits that tried to keep the blacks from using a similar name to the white Knights of Pythias took the case all the way to the Supreme Court and won it in 1913. Another important parallel order is the Improved Benevolent and Protective Order of Elks of the World. This one was founded when a black porter, per, Pullman porter on a train, found a white elks ritual that had been left behind by mistake. The whites had forgotten to copyright the ritual. And so the Blacks formed their own order and took the copyright uh, and defended their legal status as well. Um, a very powerful female partner is the Daughter Elks. Um, and they grew, these are, grew very large as well in the 20th century. And the Elks uh, still exist, as do most of these parallel orders. And they were well known for spearheading civil rights struggles in, throughout the 20th century. So I'm gonna move on and talk about three smaller orders rather than talk about the big ones, which are better known. Let me talk about one that is really surprising in some ways. It's called the United Order of Tents of J.R. Giddings and Jollifee Union. It was founded by two slave women who started organizing in the 1840s and got a, a charter from the state of Virginia uh, at the end of the Civil War. Um, it's a Christian-inspired Protestant order, basically. I don't know that they formally excluded Catholics, but they met in Baptist churches and Methodist churches and devoted to the idea of originally helping escaped slaves, but later helping the poor and engaging in mutual aid among themselves. It's an all-female order. There are no men in this order. J.R. Giddings and Jollifee, you might wonder who in the world are those people in that awkward long name. Turns out they were two abolitionist whites who served in Congress, especially Joshua Giddings. Has a fierce look about him, right? Well, he was a fierce opponent of slavery and the Fugitive Slave Act, and he probably aided the founders of this order and they named their order in part after him and his partner, John Jollifee. Badges were worn by members of this order, either members of local tents, which is what their local chapters are called. The one um, here from Savannah is a local tent badge. And the one on the other side was worn to district meetings. There were four districts spanning several states in each case in this order, and still are. Um, on the black side, on the back of these badges, it, it's black, and those were worn at funerals. So very quickly, I'm just going to say that this order grew to be about 25,000 members in 1925, and it persisted through the Great Depression, which is not true of all orders, and was 50,000 members in 1952. Uh, it is a proudly Christian order, and it stresses Christian values and has hymns through all of its activities. Uh, it engages in mutual aid among the ladies themselves, 
but also has uh, paid for old age homes, aid to the poor, and more recently scholarships for people to go to college. It still exists. It persists particularly in the Southeast. And here's a lovely picture of uh, some of the tents me uh, members uh, and you see their badge. All right, next is one, the United Brothers of Friendship and the Sisters of Mysterious Ten. This order, which grew to be just about as large as some of the parallel orders that I mentioned earlier and developed a nationwide scope, uh, emerged in Louisville, Kentucky in the 1860s. A group of young men and their teacher in a school founded it. Several of them served as uh, African-American volunteers in the Union Army uh, during the war. And uh, it was always different and self-consciously different from the Masons, the Odd Fellows, the Knights of Pythias, because as it proclaimed itself in this nice 1912 ad, it organized by Negroes for Negroes. Um, be loyal to your race by joining an exclusive Negro order. So the whole idea here is we, we aren't a parallel to any white group. We're our own thing. Um, and here's a, a wonderful badge from a uh, pretty small outpost of that order in Pennsylvania, Steelton. So at first, the United Brothers was an all-male order. In that sense, it was different from a lot of other distinctive African-American orders but it got going pretty early and it grew out of that group of men who'd fought in the Civil War. But um, women around them started organizing Sisters of Friendship groups even before they were given any permission to do so. And in 1876, 78, the Sisters of the Mysterious Ten was established, uh, which was open to relatives and other women approved by, relatives of brothers and other women that were approved by the members. Now, the sisters uh, were, shall we say, assertive for their time. If you read the official history, you'll see this description, that during the 1884 National Convention, and as it happens, New Orleans, they asked the brothers to approve a resolution, quote, asking for a united Grand Lodge composed of male and female with the right of all to vote for grand officers. In other words, they wanted to be full members of the central leadership. Uh, and uh, now um, the official history puts this in delicate words, but you can tell that nothing delicate happened here. According to the official history, considerable debate and confusion ensued. Well, I think more than that, because the men got so angry that they actually passed a resolution that disestablished the Sisters of the Mysterious Ten. And it wasn't until the next morning when the founder of the order said, hey, wait a minute, guys. The women are really important in organizing. They often do more than we do. Um, that they thought again and reestablished the Sisters of the Mysterious Ten on the old basis. And here's a badge, a lovely badge, from an early group that probably formed even before the formal order was authorized. Now this, I, I'm sorry that I can't present a prettier picture of this. The United Brothers of Friendship and the Sisters of Mysterious Ten were a big deal in Minnesota, as it turns out. Don't ask me why, I'm not sure, but this beautiful charter for a temple of the Sisters of the Mysterious Ten, founded in the 1880s, Corinthian Temple, number 132, and later renumbered to one when they got a state organization, uh, is something I bought years ago and just found in my storage area uh, a while back. And I've sent it out to be restored to have the tape taken off of it. But you can see that the colors are vibrant. And if you look around the circles around the edge, those are the 10 virtues, that's the mysterious 10, that initiates into the order have explained to them when they're being initiated. My final thing that I want to say about this group is that in 1908, 
their state level organization was founded, intermediate between the local temples and lodges and the national. And they held a big meeting, a national meeting here in St. Paul. And those were the badges that they wore, that metal badge. And uh, I, in fact, I brought my copy of the metal badge so you can see it uh, in the flesh. At its height, the United Brothers of Friendship and the sisters expanded to the states that you see in blue here, at least some presence. And in the dark blue states, they had state grand lodges like the one that formed in Minnesota. But they don't appear to have survived the Great Depression. A lot of American fraternal orders of all racial and ethnic backgrounds couldn't collect the dues that they needed to keep going uh, when the Great Depression caused people to lose their jobs and their livelihoods. And many of them did not survive that period. All right. I'm on time. Two more orders that I'll introduce you to. The next one is the Ancient Order of Knights and Daughters of Africa. It was founded in St. Louis, Missouri in 1908, just about the time that the UBF was hitting its peak that I described, um, and it billed itself as the greatest and most progressive fraternal order in the United States. In some ways, it was a more uh, civically and politically assertive order. Uh, you can see this is a, my re reproduction from an old ad of the principles that they claimed. The principles are so sublime that the white people cannot claim one word is from their brain. That is uh, another way of saying we're a black-only order and very proud of it. Uh, we take care of the sick, pay an endowment at death. This is pretty standard for a lot of fraternal orders. Uh, help members improve their condition. That means that they would provide loans to people, serve as sort of banking function. Um, urge its members to buy from black professionals and black businesses. That's number five there. But six and seven are above and beyond what quite a few of the orders of that period did. Uh, it is the champion of manhood and womanhood rights in this country and promises to secure for its members their constitutional rights by agitation and through their legal representatives. The work of this society is recognized by all races of the country and thereby will eliminate prejudice and promote the principles of brotherhood and sisterhood. Now, the interesting thing is that of the 300 African-American badges I have in my collection, only two of them have black hands. Here's why. These badges were produced by the millions by companies that sold them to fraternal orders of all uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. And so, you know, they, ref they would sell badges to black orders, but they wouldn't change the color of the hands on the bars. That clasped hand symbol is a symbol later adopted by America's trade unions. You may have, they had badges too. But uh, in this case, one of the two Ohio councils, the one in Columbus managed somehow, I don't have a manufacturer there, to get a badge with black hands. The other one in my collection that has black hands was produced in Chicago, which would have been a major center of sufficient concentration to create a market. In 1921, this order built a magnificent headquarters in uh, St. Louis, which is portrayed on this badge. And that was the year that they held their national meeting in Chicago, right at the end of World War I which was a period where many Blacks had served in the armed forces and uh, were on the move. Uh, the first great waves coming north from the south. It was a period of hope on the part of many African-Americans and their white liberal allies that there might be a breakthrough toward better race relations. But instead, there was what we see again and again across American history when there's a period of new assertion of the claims for equality, there was a fierce and violent reaction. And at the 1921 meeting of the Knights and Daughters of Africa in Chicago, the head honcho, actually the Grand Master, William Fields, 
actually called out uh, racism and called out the spread of housing covenants in the city of Chicago that were excluding blacks from key neighborhoods. Now, I have to tell you, I've studied a lot of orders and they never criticized the host city. Um, you know, they, it's like a donor at Harvard University. We only say nice things about them when they give money, even if they're really evil people, um, which has happened and is still happening. Uh, but uh, this guy actually had something very explicit to say. He talked about right here in the city, Chicago, termed the heaven for the Negro. White citizens may, if they see fit, object to the purchasing of property by our people, and upon the refusal of real estate agents to execute their wishes, they take the matter in hand and with the force of dynamite destroy the property and endanger the lives of our people. This meeting included a call from this order to the Chicago authorities to stop that. He also commented on the spread of violence from the South and the nationwide occurrence of lynching. So that's a quite assertive order. And it did not survive the Great Depression in very good shape. You can find evidence of its continued existence in the 1940s, but it was limping along and at some point disappears from the record. Now, the final order that I want to talk about is really, uh, it's a parallel order in the sense that it parallels uh, white fraternal order, the Knights of Columbus, but it's very unusual in the African-American world because most African-Americans were Methodists or Baptists. Most were Baptists or AME Methodists, my people Methodists. And so, um, the question of the emerge and, and most fraternal orders, the ones that I've talked about so far, were very intertwined with Methodist and Baptist churches. They often met in those places or, and included ministers. But the Knights of Peter Claver is the leading fraternal and benevolent and service order for Black Catholics. It was launched in a, a region of the country where Black Catholics were very numerous. Um, back at the turn of the 20th century, in Mobile, Alabama, along the Gulf Coast, in November of 1909. Importantly, it was launched by a team of seven lay people and priests who included both blacks and whites, and the order always included white and black members um, to some degree. Um, it was named for St. Peter Claver, and I have to admit, that as a Methodist, I didn't know who St. Peter Claver was uh, until I started this work, and I discovered that he lived from 1580 to 1654. He was a Spanish Jesuit. He was deployed to the New World in what is now Colombia, and in that opening picture I showed you, he's famous for greeting the captives as they were unloaded from the slave ships and ministering to them after that. Um, in mind and body, and um, conversion to Christianity. So the Knights of Peter Claver, um, like many other orders, developed a higher degree that just beyond ordinary membership that went to men who served the larger community as well as the order. And they created their ladies auxiliary, um, Ladies who meet in courts, the men meet in councils in 1922. Uh, at first, they spread along the Gulf Coast and in the south near the Gulf Coast. But by the end of World War II, this order, which flourished in the 1930s and 40s and after World War II, rather than shriveling, didn't emphasize as much uh, insurance benefits. And so it wasn't as economically vulnerable in the Great Depression. Uh, it started holding meetings in national hubs far from the South and far from New Orleans where it still regularly met. And here are some pictures I found years ago in a packet of a wonderful meeting in Los Angeles in 1948. So uh, the final thing I wanna say about this order is that it was a struggle to advance racial equality even 
under the auspices of a church that claimed that all souls were equal. And in the 1920s, there were setbacks. Uh, but by the 1930s, and especially after World War II, the Knights of Peter Claver, with the blessing of some but not all of the bishops in areas where they organized, really started taking a kind of moral leadership role in the civil rights struggle. And this 1953 Social Justice Committee plan is quite remarkable. It's remarkable because it calls on every council and court and the churches that they were part of to actually get together, talk about what to do, and do concrete things. As all, all of you who are involved in political and civic organizing know, that's the way things happen when people hold each other accountable for doing specific things. And here it included working for voting rights and working with the NAACP. By the 1950s, the Knights of Peter Claver were behind the voter drives that were beginning to spread in the South and that would feed into the modern civil rights struggle led by Martin Luther King. The Knights of Peter Claver persists. In fact, we have two ladies here from the St. Paul Court. Very honored by their presence. And uh, in 1980, in 2018, here was the Supreme Lady and the Supreme Knight talking about what is now a nationwide and to some degree international order. Uh, it, it has been able to persist, I would argue, through very different circumstances, in part because of the institutional scaffolding of the Catholic Church that it can be part of. Uh, I'll wrap up by just saying that the many stories of Black fraternal groups, these and others, reveal why it was that Governor Vardaman was opposed to organization in 1904. Even organizations that appear cautious, and believe me, in parts of the South, you had to be cautious. Uh, that kind of organization matters for the subordinated people. Um, mutual aid was carried through for families, men and women. Federated orders pooled their dues to fund the legal cases that defended their right to organize and use names, and later generated some of the very lawyers who worked for the NAACP and carried through some of the landmark civil rights cases in the 20th century. Um, and uh, these orders were active if they still existed in the great civil rights struggles of the 1950s and 60s. And I'll just close with this, a wonderful pamphlet I bought on eBay showing the Prince Hall Masons participating in Martin Luther King's uh, Jobs and Freedom March in 1963. There they are. You can find wonderful things on eBay. All right, so thank you for your patience. And I think we've got some time for discussion. Okay, gotta have it right in my face. Huh? Thank you so much for that talk. This is so interesting. I know very little about this history and I actually called both my parents last week and said, do you know anything about these organizations? They didn't know a whole lot about them. And uh, so I have just a few questions that I'll ask and then I'll read some questions from members of the audience. So as um, Professor Jacobs uh, mentioned, uh, my family has a long history with Black Greek organizations or fraternities and sororities. My grandfather joined Alpha Phi Alpha in the 1920s, mm -hmm. and uh, the, all the women in my family belong to Alpha Kappa Alpha. And I'm wondering, uh, in your understanding, um, some of the main uh, differences and similarities between these organizations and also connections. I mean, mm -hmm. the fraternity mm -hmm. sorority were very gendered. There's no gendered overlap. There's only nine of us. We're very much, uh, in, we do things together in any given city. We're very connected to each other. The organizations are very interconnected. Um, you mean nine different fraternities and sororities? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. um, right. And I, I remember you said uh, Thurgood Marshall was a Mason. He's also an alpha. Yes. So I wonder, do you know much about 
but your organizations are the ones you're talking much older. You start way earlier. I, I don't know more than I've read and heard from people, um, but I do know that many prominent um, African Americans in the professions, doctors, mm -hmm. lawyers, who, who wouldn't have been a large proportion of the population back in that early 1900 period that I'm talking about, but really were important leaders, they usually belong to both because um, most of the of the fratern fraternities and sororities you're talking about grew up in college contexts, yep. right? And so what's different about these orders that I'm talking about is that they, they grew up in the larger community. Mm -hmm. They were not, and uh, this is true of all class, all, all racial groups in the United States, uh, they're remarkable because they had in the same meetings, in the same local chapters, elected leadership at the state and national level, people from all occupational backgrounds. That is pretty amazing, and it doesn't happen very much in the United States now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you're not at all unusual. I didn't know much about these kinds of groups before I started the work uh, that led to Diminished Democracy, the book that my colleagues and I wrote, and then to the book on fraternal orders. Um, they're just, they've sort of disappeared. But if you go and look at any newspaper from the late 19th and early 20th century, you're going to find they're filled with reports of the meetings, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, that men and women of all occupational backgrounds attended in these groups. Did you mention that there was an order that was founded by an enslaved woman or was she formerly enslaved or? Yep, I mean the Grand, uh, the United Order of Tents, I mean, you know, to some degree this may be myth, but it's not entirely myth because the woman whose picture was on my slide, Annette Lane, uh, is, was active through the end of the 19th century and in, she died only in 1913 or so. And Annette Lane was a slave. Uh, she was a nurse. And because she was a nurse, she got around and, and kind of knew about needs. And she was involved in the Underground Railroad, which, you know, yeah. uh, she then uh, teamed up with the other woman about whom there is no picture and unfortunately nothing known uh, to incorporate the order in 1867 mm -hmm. in Norfolk. Um, one thing I'm wondering is how did the organizations as a sociologist, um, maybe you could say something more about how did they navigate the gender politics or the social class politics, you know, because as I, you know, for the fraternities and sororities, the class and gender, you know, were class and gender very similar and it, and, uh, yeah, how did they negotiate those politics? Were there differences in roles? Were there conflicts over that? Was there were there hierarchies that you know of? Uh, of course, um, there were. Um, if one of the things that I value most in my research is if I find a list of the members uh, that gives their occupations, and occasionally I do find those, and I snap them right up if I find them because it allows me to see um, something that I can see from old reports just by looking at the names. I can sort of tell, I know I'm not supposed to say this, this these days, but you can tell who was a man and who was a woman in these, in these old reports. And so um, the usual pattern in the gender integrated orders was that the men were in the top spots and the women were in a series of kind of um, not helping roles. They were top leaders too, but they were in the second tier roles. But they were there. Mm -hmm. And as you saw in my slide about the, the sisters, they sometimes demanded more. And they sometimes demanded more than they got. Um, class was, um, I think, something that is important for all of us to understand. These orders were all based on moral rituals. In fact, they enacted little rituals uh, each week. And the rituals were about what makes a good person. Mm -hmm. And the rituals always say that a good person is a good person regardless of their occupation, their wealth, or their level of education. I, shocking idea to, to, to say in a university context. But I would say the Christian um, ideal of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood of, 
of humanity it was something people strived for and articulated and used to justify common membership, regardless of occupation. Okay, well, I'm good. How much time do we have? Oh, we have like about 15 minutes. Okay, I have a few questions. Sure. I think these three can kind of connect. So one is what led to the demise of the orders? If any, how many are still in existence? We know there are some. And then I was also wondering, why do we not know more about this history? I think maybe you said at one point, one in every 10 African-American men was a member. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was- Of the true. Grand United Order of Oddfellows, which I believe yeah. to have been the largest of uh -huh. the orders. Um, well, as I discussed, um, a fair number of the orders that emerged either right before or right after the Civil War and uh, through the end of the 19th century. And, and really, there were hundreds of them that emerged. So one of the questions, because I'm a social scientist, one of the things I'm interested in my research is which ones managed to mm -hmm. keep growing and which ones died out. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, it was competitive. I mean, you were trying to recruit people to be members, to be loyal members, to pay dues. So you had to avoid faction fights. A lot of them died in faction fights. Mm -hmm. uh, and here I'm not just talking about African-American orders. I'm talking about all of these orders. Um, so there were thousands that tried, hundreds that survived. Um, but a lot. And I would say that uh, because they used dues to raise money for sick benefits when people got sick, on death benefits when they died, People wanted to make sure they were not thrown into a pauper's grave. So death benefits were a very, very important thing because they allowed you to have a respectable funeral. Also, your lodge mates were expected to turn out in their full regalia. You know, that picture I have at the front of my thing is, that's a group of black um, odd fellows in Alabama. I paid a lot for that postcard. I really wanted that postcard because it's wonderful. And they would have worn that kind of regalia to the funeral and to the procession to the cemetery. So um, that made them vulnerable as people aged. So if you recruited a lot of young people and you promised them death benefits and sick benefits, guess what happened when they got old? So some of them managed to adjust their payments. Some of them managed to recruit young people and others didn't. And then the Great Depression hit. And it was just a devastating event for so many of these orders. Why don't we know about them? You know, I get emails from people who say, I found this on my grandmother's grave. I found this sign on my grandfather's tombstone. What does it mean? I, I think we've forgotten. Uh, and I think part of the reason that we've forgotten is that we got to the 1960s and the 1970s and all of a sudden, things that were gender segregated in any way or racially exclusive and unequal in any way, bad. And so we just stopped joining them and stopped talking about them. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not true of the Knights of Peter Claver and the Ladies Auxiliary. They're still here. And the Prince Hall Masons are still here. But I think, especially among whites, uh, these orders were just mm -hmm. pushed aside. And some of them still do exist. Some of the ones that were larger and more sustainable are still with us. The Grand United Order of Odd Fellows has its headquarters right there in Philadelphia, that building on my slide. That's still their headquarters. Um, okay. Another kind of set of related questions. I was wondering about the roles of these organizations uh, because there were thousands of them um it seems like and, and you mentioned one helped uh enslaved people escape slavery there's the mutual aid funeral benefits civil rights activism i wonder did they perform really different roles in the different communities were they really almost fundamentally different types of organizations depending on where you were well, you know, that's a good question. And it's one thing that I try to do, uh, trying to lay the basis for some research on that. Mm -hmm. But it's a wonderful area for people to get involved in research. And part of what I'm trying to do is to assemble the data about the groups, including the statistics. 
uh, so that it'll be possible to look at some of these questions. But my impression is that some groups were more cautious. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them actually wrote into their documents, people are not to talk about religion or politics in the lodge meeting, and you'll be fined if you do. Mm -hmm. uh, why was that? They were trying to bridge between Baptists and Methodists, and they didn't want to fight, which there could easily have been. Um, some of these orders excluded Catholics, and um, so I, I want to be very clear about that. This is not all kumbaya. Um, um, and, of course, the white orders were excluding the blacks. Uh, uh, the ethnic orders were excluding other ethnicities. Um, so um, you can talk about the scale of the groups. You can talk about how bold their goals were. That's why I included the knights and daughters, because they had bolder, more secular goals along with their um, – and they had a secular story, knights and daughters of Africa. It wasn't a Bible story that they were built around. So they do vary in all those ways. So one really interesting thing um, is this idea of participation in the civil rights movement. Um, question we have here is, to what extent, if any, did these fraternal organizations work with the major political parties to dismantle uh, Jim Crow? I also wonder, you mentioned some connections between, say, Martin Luther King's march and the Masons. I wonder, did the groups work with any of the established, like the SCLC or the, you know? They worked for the NAACP. That was the, mm -hmm. the NAACP is the through line mm -hmm. from the early uh, 1900s through to the civil rights struggle. And although I don't think it has a reputation as being a militant group now, mm -hmm. it's pretty militant in some ways, certainly legally. Um, it was at the cutting edge of a fair number of the uh, protest marches and um, pressure in the South to get voting rights. And m many of these orders worked very closely and quite frankly. So that's one way. The other way is defending your right to organize. And I know that doesn't may not sound like much, but it was really a big deal because uh, all the white orders that had black groups that had similar names tried to use the state legislatures to outlaw them. And if that didn't work, they tried to use violence to outlaw them. Um, does that remind you of anything that might be happening these days? Um, uh, these things come and go. And so defending your right to persist and organize and your legal right to use a name was a, a civil rights struggle. But I think the other thing I would point to is the remarkable opportunities for women's leadership. There just mm -hmm. was more. Mm -hmm. And we studied the rituals back when we wrote the book of white and, and black female groups. And the female groups always had more of a community service themes in their rituals. And so they were doing more to reach out to the community. Hmm. There's uh, some questions that relate to thinking about today and thinking about the future. Uh, one is, how can the heritage of these organizations guide us now? Another is, what do you see as the future of these organizations? And there's another one I don't entirely understand, but it says, what are the implications of this history for this moment in time? as there is an especially significant surge of support for the black community here in the Twin Cities in terms of financial and other support from the business and excuse me, community. Is there a way to harness the energy you describe to ensure that this support creates lasting momentum? Well, I think that last one, and thank, thank you to the person who raised it, is the easiest for me to address. It's not so much necessarily the persistence of any one organization as the principle that organization matters. So that an organization has to be more than a matter of going to a business and asking for a check and hiring a couple of people to just uh, do things in our name. That's really the typical way Americans organize things now, uh, if you look at the overall picture. Uh, but face to face meeting, getting together with people, trying to find ways to cross lines and to keep meeting and keep talking about the issues that matter in your community 
and to connect beyond your local area across a district or state and nationwide. Those are just as important today as they used to be. I think the Black Lives Matter organizers, many of them understand that. And I think, you know, uh, in the minds of many white people, they may just be a bunch of people who are disrupting traffic, but I don't think that's what's really going on. I think there's actually a lot of face-to-face -face meeting going on. And one may or may not agree with some of the tactics. Um, so I don't want to use only that example, but I think there are many groups out there that understand the value of face-to-face -face organization and connection beyond local areas. Uh, and that's a principle that these the fraternal orders, black and white alike, uh, embody. And the idea of crossing class lines, mm -hmm. I have to tell you, that is very uncommon now. Most churches are, are pretty class stratified and racially stratified. And my husband and I go to a diner for breakfast every morning at 6 a.m. in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And part of the reason we do that is because we want to hang out with a cross-section of people who are not all professors at colleges or students and hear what they have to say about, you know, life, about the New England Patriots. It's hopeless at this point. We've got Aaron Rodgers in our division. Very, very bad. But, but just life in general. And so I think that's one thing I would say. Now, some of these groups are still at it. Some of them get in touch with me. They're glad to have the historical materials I put together. I'm absolutely delighted to provide them. I went to a small church in West Virginia and presented at their, you know, their, their homecoming day, presented an account of, of, of what they'd found in their attic, which was Grand United Order of Oddfellows materials. And I know where all the lodges were in West Virginia, so I just talked with them about it. That's great for me, and I am happy to do that. Um, whether the groups persist or not, I think the principles mm -hmm. that these groups embodied are worth remembering and worth reinventing in new ways in our time. I think we're done in terms of time. Just want to remind folks, um, we've got some very exciting programs coming up. Uh, May 4th, New York Times' Tom Friedman joins us online. May 10th, we've got an important conference here about uh, building um, and sustaining the profession of election administration. Um, and June 14th, we start our series on conservative voices from the Humphrey School. Uh, all that, there's information available online. This program today, which was so terrific, will be available on YouTube and as a podcast. I want to thank our terrific moderator, uh, Enid Logan, professor in sociology, and our guest presenter, Theda Scotchpole from Harvard University. Thanks to both of you.